Okay, so how do I cheers you and do the intro? Because I got a drink. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you can't edit it. Yeah. Because we just made that rule. <laughs> so. Cheersies. Cheers. Welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the third episode of Nothing Unusual Here, the podcast where we talk about survival horrors, biohazards, and survival horror genres. I don't know if we've ever said this on the show, but actually the beauty of this podcast, for me, I don't know what we're going to talk about ever going into you're not, it. Oh, yeah. You're so going in blind so when time. you're asking me what should the title of this episode be or what are we talking about today, I have no idea. Why so would I know? When you do your segment, This Day in Resident Evil, you don't actually know what you're about to say? No, the only thing I know, the only research I do is this day in Resident Evil history, <laughs> but I, except last time, it's not, it's not supposed to be what we talk about for the majority. It's a segment. Anyway, you're Julia, not Julia Smith, and I am Dead by Donovan, and this is our podcast, Nothing Unusual Here. And what are we talking about today? You don't know? <laughs> <laughs> I never know. <laughs> I don't know if we discussed this, but the main topic of today's show is going to be The Keeper's Diary. It just came out. We're not going to do a reaction viewing of it. Like... It's 20 minutes. Check it out for yourself if you haven't already seen it. We will spoil and tear apart the whole thing. But just to let you know in advance, I'm loving it every repeat viewing. I've seen it five times now, and it just keeps getting better. I got to say, at first, I was a little disappointed. Not disappointed, but like I had higher expectations for it. I wanted them to expand on some things, and they just did it by the book from the game. Yeah. But we're going to get into that later. Right now, uh, ooh, so it's now July, our third month into the podcast. And you might be wondering why we didn't have a July, 4th fourth, fourth of July episode. And uh, that's because we had an unfortunate accident. Julia blew her finger off and I had to take her to the emergency room. We were going to podcast after playing with fireworks and it, we had to cancel. Show them your finger. It's gone forever huh. okay what else do we have oh something i forgot to show on last month's episode julia started painting oh no she started painting fucking resident <laughs> evil backdrop. this is not supposed to be seen and she painted me the rpd entrance and we gotta um, hang it up julia did not have the colors that she needed and or the heart and dedication, or I take little to no credit for this. And again, I will hashtag be better next time. Uh, I love you got like some of AI Jill's artistic styling in there where it's RP period D period. Well, there was a period, but then I outlined it in black. That's what AI Jill says. But I love it, and uh, we got to get you to start painting more. Maybe we can use it as backgrounds for cartoons for Alpha Force. And uh, then, I don't know, maybe we could transformative it enough to sell them. Yeah, change or, it completely so that people would actually want to buy it. You make enough recreations, and we just give them out for, you know, appreciation towards members. Yeah, because my work <laughs> isn't worth anything. <laughs> What do we call this episode of Nothing Unusual here, episode three? We got to title them. I was thinking uh, The Creeper's Diary. Yeah, I've been trying to think of something funny for like 10 minutes now. The Keeper's Diarrhea. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> oh, let's ask Jill. Hey, Jill, what do we call this episode of the Nothing Unusual Here podcast where we cover The Keeper's Diary short film? Hey. Let's call this episode Keeper's Secrets. The Diary Unleashed. Sounds intriguing and fitting for diving into that wild short film. It'll grab attention and give listeners a hint of the wild ride they're in for. What do you think? Julia Ew. suggested The Keeper's Diarrhea, and I was thinking The Creeper's Diary. Those are both hilarious. How about combining them for maximum effect? 
We could call it the Creeper's Diarrhea, a Keeper's Diary special. It's got that perfect mix of humor and intrigue. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Nailed it. Yeehaw, Jill. That is good. We're going with that. You've decided it. Yeehaw. Glad you like it. The Creeper's Diarrhea, a Keeper's Diary special it is. Let's make this episode <laughs> one for the history books. It's just too bad this isn't episode number two, if you know what I mean. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Episode number two, and we're calling it The Creeper's Diarrhea. Talk about perfect timing. This one's going to be a real shit show in the best way possible. Let's get this shindig started. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to say number three for diarrhea. <laughs> what? Dude, isn't number three when you're doing both of them? I was like, number three is time? diarrhea, number four is vomit. We just made up this whole thing. And now it is time for your real segment to kick off because we kind of botched it last month, but it turned into this kind of bloated ordeal of looking over Clancy's, you know, Clancy Javis's whole ordeal in Resident Evil 7. But yeah, that was your this day mm -hmm. in Resident Evil that didn't actually happen. We couldn't figure out the exact date. Uh, I want to address something from that last episode. I think my theory is correct that there were three cameras and it's because Clancy is... He's not wearing a sweater. I said, oh, it looks like he's wearing a sweater during 21. If you look closely, that's fucking like ace bandages wrapped around his arm where he got loser carved in from the happy birthday where he supposedly burned to death. So he clearly didn't burn to death or get burns. And he's got a bandage on his arm after that. He could have burns on that arm. If he's mold infected like Ethan was, he's healing. So maybe all his skin healed back, but mm -hmm. he's still got a gnarly messed up arm. Yeah. It's a pretty big oversight on your part. It's really disappointing in you. I don't think anyone's ever noticed that in the world. So we're breaking this to everyone now. Yeah. Kind of embarrassing. Nobody caught that in the comments. <laughs> Here's the thing. Last month, you gave me a day. It's going to be released. I do all the research. Nothing happened that day. We have to look into maybe something happened that day. It was a big ordeal. This this month, short and sweet, we got some info. On this day in Resident Evil history, July 10th, 1998, the same year of the Raccoon City Uprising or whatever they call uprising. it. Uprising. <laughs> Dead rising? I don't know. <laughs> you know, outbreak. Destruction yeah, that's of Raccoon City. I'm, sorry. I'm looking for the, the word downfall. outbreak. The same year as the outbreak in Raccoon City, Murphy Seeker is recruited to the UBCS. Now, if you're wondering what that stands for, for people who are new here, it is the Umbrella Biohazard Countermeasure Service. It's Umbrella. Yeah, I, saw, I said Umbrella. I'll give you that. Who would you cast as Murphy Seeker? It's really hard because he means so much to me. <laughs> you want my honest? Yeah. Tim Pool. Well, that's definitely... <laughs> we don't need to get into that. No, 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 no wait, please! No! <sighs> what the fuck? You did it! A successful first this day in Resident Evil history. No one knew that. People were just going to go about their day through July 10th, not even knowing the significance of it, you know? Yeah. Nobody so. knew. It was so <laughs> important. Something you don't care about, but it came out right when we were recording last month's episode, and I wanted to do a review on it, but then I couldn't wait, and I watched it anyway, is the new Metal Gear Solid 3 Delta remake trailer. And it was fucking amazing. Why do you say I don't care about it? Like, I haven't watched it twice. <laughs> you can't even tell me. Literally You can't times. even tell me the main character. <laughs> of Metal Gear? Mm-hmm. Snake. But are we talking, is it different in MGS3? Yeah, what snake? Solid. No, that is not Solid Snake. Well, it's not Liquid. He's in it, but he's not the lead. That's it. There's a <laughs> Master Chief. Naked Snake. This, this is new. This is, this, he's never been the lead before. He's never existed before. It's a remake. <laughs> this is virtuous mission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Listen, uh, I can, I can be the expert in Resident Evil and Metal Gear is just a little bit out of my room. I just know the basics. Apparently the release date leaked and it was like November 12th or 22nd or whatever. What day did Kennedy's head blow up? 23rd. Okay. So it's not that. that no, 22nd, 22nd. 
Was it the twenty second? Because it's sixty three. Sixty three. Yeah, I told you. I I always you I always week. mix it up. When I taught you that last week. No, I was the one who told you that last week. <laughs> Roll the tapes. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are the rumors that MGS three Delta is coming out in November, or is Wait. it the collection Volume Two is out in November? Because I can't. They can't release uh, MGS three before the second volume remasters come out. So either way, I got limited time. I got to stream some Metal Gear Solid before everyone has access to MGS4. You know, everybody get ready. Kind of special being the only person to be able to play MGS4 because I have my PS3. I got one of those back in my parents' house. Before I even tell you, can you guess what happened with the trailer? The trailer came out, but not a release date. Yeah, no. Someone accidentally let a release date slip, and I'm not sure if it's on the volume. What's two the point? Why are they releasing a trailer for? Someday in the future. Because you can showcase what you have and generate hype. Yeah, but I would say that release date then is too soon. November? They should be touting that date by now if it's that soon. Yeah. Like, so I think GTA it's a, I think it's a volume is, two next year. Yeah. And they already put out trailer and the date for that. Like, if it's, it's been seven months since the GTA 6 trailer dropped. In my life Time has not been the so same. Fast. I've been different ever since I saw it. I don't know about you. Okay. Anyway, so what we have with the Metal Gear Solid remake, like the Silent Hill 2 remake, both are being remade from Konami, and fans are in an outrage yet again over some female character that they made fugly. You know the boss from MGS3? What do of we- course. Here, what do we have here? Is this... So that is the new character model for the boss, Voyavoda. It's not Big Boss. This is the boss, the mother of U.S. Special Forces. She led the world to victory in World War II. She was the leader of the Cobra unit, and this is the moment we find out she defected and teamed up with the Soviets. I've heard of her. (laughs) Well, anyway, do you have any problems with how she looks? No. People are saying they made her look so much younger and then they also they're like complaining about her hair not being so beautiful golden blonde and stuff why is her ear like disappearing where on the left one our left it's probably in motion or something now see everyone has a problem with her looks ai generated it looks good because I saw this in motion on the, this is a screen capture mm-hmm. of the trailer. Everything in the trailer is incredible. My one worry is they got the complete, like original voice actors, voice acting tracks from the game. Like all the dialogue is exactly the same. It sounds great. And they have the music back, but back when this first came out in 2004, 2005, they had, They got sued because one of their Japanese guys, the score producer, songwriter, whatever, ripped off an old ass Russian artist and they got sued for it. And that's why the song never appeared in MGS4. And my worry is that song that made everyone cry at the end of this game isn't going to be in the remake. And that would be a travesty. No point in remaking. But getting to my discovery on this, everyone's outraged about her hair not being so yellow and golden and shiny and shit. And I noticed during the whole trailer that the entire piss filter is missing from the game. Here's what it looks like. When you add the piss filter, I think we'd get a lot less complaints. It's not as shocking. That's what the original game looked like, but... Oh, I know what game we're talking about now. (laughs) Um, with that being said, I love everything in the trailer. I do have a disappointment in the boss that this is looking like a shot for shot remake of the original, which the original was great, but the original was restrained like they do with much of everything Kojima does. His original, his original, his original, (laughs) his original problem, (laughs) his original vision for the boss and all her concept art and everything she was the mother of the special forces she gave birth to ocelot on the battlefield of world war ii yeah and then the rothschild stole her baby from her and made her go into space and get irradiated and cancer and stuff well anyway her original concept design being the most badass motherly woman on the battlefield. She was going to run around everywhere with her 
tit exposed, like her left breast, her heart, her tit, and she was going to give birth, or she was going to breastfeed on the battlefield, but still keep that titty out, even when she's not breastfeeding, just to like intimidate. So she's going to leave that titty out to intimidate the enemy forces. And when you see that one lone titty running around jiggling from the machine gun fire and everything, you knew who that was. That's no man. You know, if it's just a normal woman, you're like, oh, they they're drafting women now. But no, you see that titty, you know, it's the boss and you know, you're fucked if you're on the enemy side. And they didn't, obviously they didn't do that here. I, I, watched, still be exposed. I watched the whole trailer and there's no titty. <laughs> like, I, I don't see enough to rule it out. Anyway, another thing I want to point out for anyone who's new to the Metal Gear Solid series, you play this game on release and you see some <laughs> don't go complaining to X and your Instagram or whatever, making like uh anti-woke posts claiming this is woke. No, Vulgan was always fucking right in a bitch and grabbed his balls all the time. You remember that? Yeah. Like, there's always been absurd I don't even want to say homoerotic stuff. It's like everything. There's something for everyone. There's uh butt sex between a man and a woman. There's butt sex between a man and a man. There's butt sex between Vamp and Scott Dolph, who is Fortune's father. And Fortune kind of has a relationship with Vamp, the dude who was fucking her so father. What I'm hearing is there's something for everyone as long as you're into butt sex. <laughs> But it's subtle. There, You don't ever see straight up butt sex, but if you look in the medical viewfinder for Eva when you're playing her, you can see she's had rectal tearing. Jeez Louise. <laughs> it's in her medical records, and you can see that she's had breast implants, too. How good were breast implants in 1960? When does Snake Eater take place? Three, four? Oh, no. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I watched Breast Men, and I've seen how terrible the boob jobs were back then. If I was Big Boss, I would be thankful Eva took off. <laughs> I don't have anything to say to that. <laughs> uh, just know that the breast implants back in the 60s, they all looked like Tara Reed's breast implants. In that case, jeez. <laughs> oh, um, I'm wrapping this up like we're done here. Yeah, so, like a, there's only halfway through page one. Oh, RE9 news. There is not much RE9 news, but <laughs> this look at this. This is the extent of the RE9 news. I just feel like we got to cover it because everyone's freaking out about it and it's so stupid. That's it? Yep. There's this photo of the director of Resident Evil 7, okay. and he said, we're making a new Resident Evil. He didn't specify if this is Resident Evil 9. Did he direct 8? No. This is the director of 7. So he's just a random old director. Seven so much better than 8. Okay, so they're but going back to their roots. We don't know if this is a remake, a spinoff, you know, if it's... Does uh, he know? He's got to know something. Look at his eyes. He's serious. Yeah, he looks like... The Japanese... He looks like he's breaking bad news to us. Japanese, honestly. like, don't don't fuck with your emotions or make jokes and shit. They're, I know they that... They have honor. He would have to c commit seppuku. <laughs> oh, um, do you even know the name of that guy? Nagasaki? Oh, that was close. <laughs> <laughs> Koshi Nakanishi? Now what do we do? Oh, we're going into the $5 supers. $5 super thanks. We still haven't come up with a good name for this segment. But this is the segment where you and your friends and your family, everyone you know, can send us $5 in the chat on this video. And then by next month, we will address it. We'll re If you want to just do a shout out, tell us how much you love Julia's new missing finger, you know, $5 and we'll read it. We'll say your name and we appreciate it. Spending that much money was reckless and stupid. So our first $5 super thanks comes from Daily Basis. I think, you know, I hate how the YouTube does this at thing and changes people's usernames to their handles. So I believe this is Daily Basis. Sorry if I got it wrong. His question is for Jill. 
Hey, Jill, we got a $5 super here from Daily Basis. He writes, a question for Jill. Which tactical technique would help a noob nobody survive a compound full of B.O.W.'s, dazzling them one by one with sick, nasty dance moves and then sliding on past them or finding a good hiding place, then shouting as loud as you can, I'm no stranger to covert tactics, remember? Hey there, Daily Basis. Thanks for the super chat. If you want to survive a compound full of BIUs, bioorganic weapons, you've got two solid options, <laughs> dazzle and slide. You can try dazzling those BIOs with some sick dance moves. Throw in a few pirouettes, moonwalks, and maybe even a dab or two. Once they're bedazzled and confused, you can slide past them like a pro. It's risky, but hella stylish. Hiding and shouting. Alternatively, find a good hiding spot, hunker down, and then scream your head off. It's a classic tactic. When those boos come rushing, you'll have a chance to slip away while they're distracted by the noise. Yeah, but which technique is better? Yeah, that's the question. They, they paid five fucking dollars. Please answer the question. All right. Straight answer. For five dollars, here's the lowdown. Go with finding a good hiding place. Shout, I'm no stranger to cover tactics. To create a diversion. It's a classic move that keeps you safe and lets you plan your next steps. Dance moves are flashy, but stealth wins the game. Stay sharp out there! Oh, I forgot to add the Krauser button. I have him. Oh, can I do that? I'm no stranger to covert tactics, remember? Damn. Now I get why you're talking like that. <laughs> Thank you, Daily Basis. You have any thoughts on the tactics? Well, no. <laughs> what would you do? When it comes to dancing or hiding and screaming. <laughs> Against B.O.W.'s in a compound. The B.O.'s? What was she calling them? <laughs> the booze? The B.O.'s? She kept switching. <laughs> oh. Oh. Shit. Okay, so this, you're going to have to pretend like you know what's going on with this. I was going to load, uh, like, game clips, but I was like, you know, no, Juliet good. doesn't fucking care. No, Julian knows everything already. That's you read the, the book. Truth. You read the book. You know the character. Yeah. You've played the board game. Okay, our next super thanks comes from Hugh Janus 13 and he writes, Do we think Capcom gave Tyrell a bigger role in RE3R for woke points? And do you know who Tyrell is? Yeah, from RE3. And he has a bigger part in Revelations? No, the remake is Shit. RE3. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he has a bigger part in the remake. Yes, he's got a bigger part in the remake, but I don't think it was for woke points. Now, we discussed woke points in the last podcast, the DEI stuff, and that shit is real for, like, Disney's credit score for these banks that threaten, like... So I don't think Tyrell in the remake was expanded upon for woke points. I think they got enough woke points by making Jill a bull dyke lesbian that doesn't wear a skirt. She's a girl boss that don't need no man, even though she clearly does throughout the whole story of RE3. But yeah, I believe Tyrell was expanded upon because he was the least expanded on in the original. You see him for two seconds. He dies. Either way, if you see him in the basement or the fourth floor data room, he blows up. Unfortunately, one, he blows up by opening that safe on, in the basement, or he blows up by blowing himself up trying to kill Nikolai. So we never got to meet him, talk to him. He had the most blank canvas to, you know, be someone with. Like, mm -hmm. they could add so much more to him. And he is one of the better he's like one of the best characters in the re3 remake and he still dies at the same point that he dies in the original he mm -hmm. doesn't go any further he still makes it to the hospital dies on october 1st yeah 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 i would say it could be a problem if they change someone to be woke that wasn't i mean not like woke but you know if they change someone's race for woke points that can be an indication of I think like removing points. removing sexism is for woke points. So we we lose the skirt, we lose the pickup lines, you know, like Carlos isn't trying so hard to fuck Jill in the remake, mm -hmm. and she is that girl boss that 
We've been sealed. That so she much. always was meant to be. <laughs> Dude, she was compassionate, understanding, and patient with everyone in the original. When she finds out Carlos is UBCS, she's like, you guys are the ones responsible for this. But then gladly teams up with them because she knows you like she's fucking smart you know like Mm -hmm. i need more people to help me out and stuff like that we're all in this situation together but uh yeah i don't think tyrell was for woke points if resident evil never existed and then came out today it would be shit on so much for the woke points Mm -hmm. that they're trying to get like just look at stars bravo team so diverse sex gender race all, around, all across the board, and that was never perceived as woke, and everyone accepted that, and everyone was a great character doing their capabilities, what you know we know them to be capable of doing from their bios, and yeah, and like the mansion and RPD, they never even have fucking bathrooms, so they can't even have transgender bathrooms mm-hmm. to begin with. Well, it's a house, you know. Usually, houses <laughs> don't have gendered bathrooms. It's a but I really, really think. They've done a great job of just putting out what the fans want, and there's really been no pandering for woke points. If anything, like, a lot of it is with sexism and stuff, and Capcom's been doing it right. They won't let the women age past, you know, like, Leonardo DiCaprio would still date all of them. Jill hasn't aged a day past 23 in 30 years, and Capcom will not do it it's like the fucking costco hot dog there's the one guy in charge of capcom and he was like if you fucking raise the price of that hot dog you're right. fired and so if jill ever becomes 24 you're fucking fired <laughs> it's fair yeah and it's it's what the fans want you so sure you sure you're done with that we have two more supers <laughs> Okay, so our third and fourth super thanks for this episode comes from our friend R.E. Tard Alpha Squad, Serving Zombies. Serving Zombies writes, Since Steve is basically living in a prison camp, does Steve's super secret surprise kiss make more sense? Since Steve is trans, will that scene stay or go? And he's talking about in the remake. Yeah, so what we have to remember here is that Steve is only 17, so he's got to be crazy horny, okay? <laughs> and yes, being in a prison and being that age, you're going to take what you can get, okay? <laughs> Before Claire showed up, Steve only had a picture of his mother to crank it to. We don't really want to talk about that, do we? <laughs> And then as for him being trans, I don't know what Servings is getting at. Uh, I just Googled trans and it says transgender, which is often shortened to trans, is an umbrella term referring to people whose gender does not align with the sex that they were assigned. Notice it's an umbrella term. Oh, shit. (laughs) It's an interesting (laughs) choice of words now, isn't it? Uh. So, anyway, that scene can stay regardless of Steve's trans-Canadianism. Yeah, I reached out to Servings <laughs> and I was like, what are you saying here? And he said, oh, Steve's trans. Or, I mean, he said, oh, Steve's Canadian. Uh, so the scene can stay regardless of that. And then since Steve is underage, he's actually the one being taken advantage of. Let's not forget, just like those hot lady teachers who sleep with their students, <laughs> you only ever <laughs> see the teachers going to jail. <laughs> yes. And we never see what Claire did to get busted in the opening of Code Veronica. So True. maybe she was trying to abduct or touch another kid like she does in every <laughs> entry of the series. <laughs> Oh, thank you for that, Servings. That was a fucking great question. I don't know if I stand by that at the end there. I'm (laughs) Team Claire, Team Nurturing Mothering Figure. Okay. Age of Consent is 16 in most states. Now, Serving Zombies also dropped another $5, and he writes, How would you update Claire's based line of cross-dressing freak for modern audiences? Do you want to take that, too? Also, we have, if you need a refresher, right there. Alfred, cross-dressing freak! For the record, I would never forget that. And uh, the answer Don't is... Don't steal my joke. There's, that's not your answer. I'm asking you for real. The answer is, ask Julia. It says oh, right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what do you think? What, gonna... what would you... How would you modernize that famous line, the most famous line from Code Veronica? 
Well, we have to be sensitive. For modern audiences. Yeah, exactly. We have to be sensitive. So are you going so, for woke points? Well, here's the thing. Cross-dressing doesn't actually mean trans. It's actually just a whole other thing. Yeah. But it is insensitive to call someone a freak just because that's what they're into. So we do have to think of how can she both insult him without insulting a community of people who Wait, enjoy start cross over. I got a great idea. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, what do you think on this? And you just lay in with the most insensitive, vulgar, derogatory terms. Be like, Alfred, you f- child f- pedicle f- orphans. F- put them anywhere near your. F- no. uh, That's good. <laughs> I'm not going to say any of that publicly. Anyway. Uh, that's not what I was going to say, but I wanted you to say that and then I'd censor it all so no one would ever hear what you said. You know, if she wants to be sensitive, she would say, you're acting a little weird today, Alfred. I've never seen you like this. I just want to make sure that you're happy in the decisions that you're making personally and I won't judge your kinks, but, um, (laughs) I don't think you should be taking someone else's identity. Okay. Well... You want to hear my answer? Yeah. So Alfred hijacks the plane. They have no controls over it. And he's on the monitor communicating with them, laughing at them. And then Claire pipes up and she, this remember this is for modern audiences. We're appealing to a younger crowd and we're not trying to hurt any feelings, Mm -hmm. but uh, we're going to be as hip as possible. Okay. Okay. This is also partly a prediction Claire could possibly say this in the upcoming remake that is not confirmed, but I know for 100% that the remake is coming. Okay, so Claire says, Alfred, you femboy goon and cross Rizzler, quit yapping and gritty this flight back to Ohio before Chris Rizfield enters the chat on Skibbity. Genius. Where's your energy? Well, uh, there's nothing to say. You left me speechless. With okay, and that was the $5 super thanks. We got through all of them. Thank you, guys. And I'm glad we didn't get derailed into a whole half episode on, you know, uncovering. You know, I like uncovering something new and finding some conspiracy. I always say the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. So with the $5 super thanks, um, if you guys want a shout out, you want a message for Jill, you want to ask us a question, we'll look into it and we'll address it on next month's episode. So in the comment section, you just hit that super thanks button and drop us $5. You can do more if you want, but it won't get you anymore. So now what are we moving on to? Oh, we're going into the keeper's diary. Yes. The main topic of the night. I love it. I was let down initially by like, there's no characters. There are no characters in the movie. Mm -hmm. You got the keeper narrating the whole thing and they just, what? So it's a combination of the keeper's diary file from the original resident evil and the remake. And they don't expand on anything. It's a lot of telling you. Like they say, show don't tell. Mm-hmm. And with the narration, it is all just telling, even though they're showing us things. I would like for when he starts his narration and goes into some event that was significant to write about, then it just blends yeah. into some storytelling with dialogue between characters. Yeah, my initial thought when I watched it and I saw like written by whoever, I was like, Rit- it's not written by them. It's reading word for word. <laughs> <laughs> Still, you got to write a screenplay. Yeah, and everything. I, I get and, that. But... Uh, I don't want to come out too harsh right away. I got to ease my fans and listeners. <laughs> well, you into loved this. it. You yeah, loved it. I'm loving it now. Initially, I was disappointed upon all these repeat viewings because people think I'm fucking exaggerating when I tell them on stream that we have 300 Resident Evil fan films that we've been going through and watching. We've seen all mm-hmm. of them. We've seen more Resident Evil fan films than anyone else on the planet. I have them all mm-hmm. on my external. 
and it was way too much to program and find my favorite scenes of other ones. Yeah. But this is by far the best Resident Evil fan film ever made. Scott, come tasty. Yeah, when it comes to fan films, this is easily, you know, top two, only competing with children who filmed in their parents' house and have no set <laughs> or costumes. those films have fucking heart. Exactly. And I can't, like, discredit. There is, there is a limit of, like, poor production quality, or there's, a, there's some sort of ratio. It's mm-hmm. like cheap well, low-budgetness versus how old the people are. And if it's a little kid and that's more acceptable and everything, it's so fun. To even watch high school age kids make fan films. Alpha team comms check in. But this one did it where none of it's cringe. I think we've got it. Wesker! Jill! The final cipher! You were right! I'm not I don't I don't cringe at any of it, and these are adult actual actors. Mm It's got that going where so many other fan films don't have that with the adult actors. Yeah. When you have a full crew, adult actors, no moms involved. I think you're freaking late. I always thought you were like lame sauce, but now you're like uber late sauce, bro. You're like almost as cool as Severoff. You're held to a higher caliber <laughs> standards than than other fan films that we've watched. And then you have Chris Redfield in it, even. No! Don't go! It's yeah. like, this is, has got to be good. So anything negative I say is with that perspective of like, I'm not. I'm not saying like this is this is obviously the best fan film <laughs> ever, but I I want movie quality. Speaking of movie quality, I did have an issue with the aspect ratio of the film. Uh, watching it from my that's something you're big on. When you're doing horror, I don't know if you want that tight of a window. You know, it perfectly fills my widescreen monitor, but. Then you get these Dutch angle horror shots involved and it's so much is just on the ends with nothing going on. I I just wish they went for a fuller frame picture on this. I'd have to watch it all over again to even when think I, about when that. When I watch so. it on my desktop, I feel like I'm missing so much. It's kind of like seeing the evil within the first time before they added the patch where they gave you the full frame to see everything. That was one little problem i had when watching the so like this short film is meant to be watched on a bigger screen when i watched it out in the living room on the tv i had no issue with the aspect ratio but when i'm watching on my monitor not full screen too it's like yeah it feels like like a lot of stuff's cut off feeling Mm -hmm. anyway what else do we have to talk about it so if you didn't know uh charlie krovzlovsky is that how you say his name sure He is the original live action Chris actor from the original Resident Evil and Pablo Kuntz. Pablo Kuntz. Say it right. (laughs) So we got we got the original Chris Redfield body face actor, not voice actor from Resident Evil one playing the keeper in this. But then we have Pablo Kuntz the Wesker voice actor from the original game. They don't credit him as Wesker. The dude who's playing Wesker in the research area with the hunter. But um, that is Pablo's voice, voice acting researcher, but it's Wesker's voice. And clearly with the shades and the hair and everything is supposed to be Wesker. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they couldn't call him Wesker. Mm -hmm. Since this is nonprofit fan film, Capcom was totally cool with them releasing this. Their budget of 50K. Yeah, they crowdfunded GoFundMe, the whole thing, all the money, and you have to spend all that money, don't you? Because you can't have any profit from this to have this up on YouTube. Yeah. And it's impressive. How much of the budget went to those two actors? Oh, yeah. I want to know how much of the budget went into that Excite 1998 swimsuit model poster in the background of the poker scene. Because that is straight out of the original Resident Evil (laughs) basement storage room in the lab. Mm -hmm. And that is little details like that that I fucking loved. I know you you lost your shit when you saw the Safsprin Aqua Cure when Mm -hmm. Charlie was handed those. You know, a problem with fan films that we've seen all too much, all 300 fan films we've seen, 
is fans think we want to see the fucking video game played out. Right. And they do that. Sometimes they'll do that walking yeah. stupid and turning tank controls and then going Door into opening. inventory. Yes. And then the worst of all that is they don't edit. They don't cut anything down. They show every single thing, like mm -hmm. walking around the house, putting my shoes on, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And in this, I got to say the best editing that I appreciated the most was when Jill comes into the West Wing corridor outside the Keeper's room. And even though the Keeper's room is never locked in the video games, you can just walk in. That. Yeah, <laughs> you're the one who pointed that out. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jill feels the doorknob that it's locked and then immediately seamless edit cuts to her down on her knees, picking it with the lock pick. And we didn't have to see her turn the doorknob and then go into her inventory, pull out the lock pick. Yeah. Doing all that. And I really appreciated that, but the edit itself was really good going from that hand to then the next shot of still the hands, but it's almost seamless. Like you're like, Whoa, wait, what did I miss? They built all these sets. Like they themselves was low budget production, even though they got 50,000 for it, you know, they constructed all the sets themselves. You can kind of see it when Jill leaves and she closes the door and like the walls give out a little, but it is, it is impressive. And look, I got pictures right here if you want to see them. So look at how good of a job they did. What do you think about this? So this is the remake one still this one angle of the keeper's diary room. And so we could assume yeah. that Scott on the floor, mm -hmm. but if you watch the keeper's diary, that cabinet, that clock, that yeah. uh, coat hanger, the, the hanger itself and the bottles, that's all there. The door is in the right location, doorknob in the right spot. It's great. What about the Jennifer Aniston poster? Okay. So the keeper's not in that closet, but that's where they put the queen poster, the Bohemian oh, Rhapsody okay. poster. Oh, because he was in the closet. You stole my joke. <laughs> you stole my joke. <laughs> Low hanging fruit. <laughs> okay. So that something mode or whatever, that woman, yeah. that is the Jennifer Aniston poster. Okay. But notice there's no typewriter in the keeper's room. Mm -hmm. And in both games, he's just writing in his diary, like paperback. Yeah. Why'd they choose to do a typewriter? I honestly think it was that for itchy, tasty date thing where it's got the two slashes. But you were the one who pointed out maybe it's a diary with the date slashes set at the top of the header. Yeah. So you can write in the date. So. Yeah, this is something no one's ever thought of or discussed. Like, what if the Keeper didn't write those slashes? Well, I want to look at more. It's just a missed date that he didn't get to fill in because he was so zombified. He's all Joe Biden, you know? Yeah, but I want to look at more because in the movie, he's writing like the full, like May 4th, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And like long form like so if it's a diary that has the slashes that would be short form well his last entry is like may 25th so there he should not even be writing for for the month to start yeah 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 so i but think it's just a, a mistake not, of being a zombie you know no but like in his previous entries he's writing out m-a-y for oh you're you right know, yeah right you want to actually see the original documents yeah and say, i can't I can't it make does, an argument. It does say the month. It doesn't say the number. Yeah. But I also think, yeah, easy. He just, he was sick. Oh, uh, what other picture do we have here? Okay. So we got closer to the desk that he's, so he's got so many alcohol bottles and pills in here. Uh, that could be the saf sprint. That could be attention to detail of the doctor giving him stuff after his rash and everything. Mm -hmm. Never even thought of that. Well, look at that. They even got the plaid jacket on the back and then the jacket hanging up. Mm-hmm. That's, they did such a good job with this set. I just wish they kind of made the walls a little grimy and shittier looking because it's kind of clean. It's got, it's got the original RE1 feel with the walls yeah. on the set. And you don't need a budget to make something shitty. <laughs> just look at the other 299 fan films. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then we also have our friend, the keeper right there coming out of the closet. There he is. What do you think of casting Chris as that guy? Looks good. Fine by me. Also, I don't know if people know this or he not. He looks a little younger. 
And he's like full zombie, so that's not very nice to say. <laughs> oh no, dude! Now <laughs> we got to be nice to Charlie and try and get him on this podcast. I have nothing against him. Honestly, he did a great job. I hey, 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 hey! I don't hey. want Charlie on the podcast <laughs> with boring ass stories, putting us to sleep. <laughs> I watched that Critical Drinkers podcast. And they were trying to be as nice as possible to him. What about you guys? What's your what's your typical choice? Whiskey, like bourbon, rye, beer, um, and uh, I tend to uh, just uh, uh, you know go for the middle of the road stuff. I don't I don't want to spend too much money, but um, uh, you know there's uh, like. Um, uh, it's a long answer to this very simple <laughs> question. <Yeah. laughs> like I, try, I try to shop local. Uh, there's like this. Uh, 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 there's a, a local. I live in Sonoma County in California, and there's a there's a local one called. Uh, okay, so yeah, this was written by Andrew Salo Salio Salio. Well, anyway. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce that dude's name, but he did a good job. It's impressive because I don't even think he was affiliated with uh, Roe, Residents of Evil. He just hit them up and was like, I got this screenplay idea. And Ooh, honestly, it's I not even it. an original idea. It's something every fan has wanted to make. It's like, why wasn't this made sooner? Anyway, what? I got an idea. What? We're going to make a rival production company called Wade. <laughs> what? Roe v. Wade? Yes. <laughs> what do we call it? What does Wade stand for? I mean, it's well, we gotta ask Jill. It. We gotta ask Jill. Hey, Jill, you know Residents of Evil, that YouTube production channel that made that amazing short film, The Keeper's Diary? Well, Julia just came up with an idea. She wants to be a rival production company against them called Wade, but we don't know what Wade stands for. W-A-D-E. What should it stand for? All right. Let's come up with something that stands out. How about W, A, uh, D, E? Standing for Warriors Against the Dead Epidemic, it's got that punchy, badass vibe that fits perfectly for a rival production company in the horror genre. Let's give them a run for their money. <laughs> she didn't come up with anything It's clever. not bad, but I was like, eh, it would be weapons, right? Like, Yeah, weapons against... Something evil. Yeah. <laughs> Weapons against demolishing evil. <laughs> We're the bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what was I talking anyway, about? Anyway, sorry. Uh, so just... this Andrew Ryder guy, discredit any shit I give them because I absolutely love this this production. Right, right, and right. I will be watching it over and over. It uh, was kind of disheartening to see that it hasn't broke 160,000 views yet. Something that was so highly anticipated, crowdfunded, and it's like, this is my niche of a channel. Well, it's not I'm good. never going to top anything like that. <laughs> but It's getting uh, a little too personal. <laughs> no. One can dream. We're going to do it. It's fine. But the impressive thing with this too, fucking props for having real Dobermans. Yeah. Real dogs real. in cages. Cute dogs. Yeah, those dogs were happy they and they were, were so loving sweet. life. And there was even a pig. Yeah. <laughs> but Welcome to Raccoon City couldn't afford a real ass dog. That was the shittiest, worse than PS5 graphics, Doberman zombie dog I've mm -hmm. ever seen. 2002 Resident Evil slapping some baloney yeah, onto yeah, a yeah. dog. That was better than what they did in 2020 or whatever year that came out. It's expensive to train a dog not to eat the meat off its back, you know? Yeah, yeah. They talk about that in the commentary of the first movie. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, props for that. But not only the live action animals, but they had a CG hunter. And that CG hunter's CG looked better than the CG dog in Welcome to Raccoon City. I'd say even better than the dogs in the Netflix show, too. Yeah, I think the hunter is the standout part of the film. Like, it's that's their moment. Oh, that's the draw, too? Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's the standout it's like, part. It's the only thing that, like... Look at what we've had. To, different. Oh, you know, if anyone else hasn't, like, looked into Resident Evil fan films, just look at this shit, what we've had to watch. <laughs> There's that French nemesis. Oh. 
And then look at that liquor. You know, liquor's got a kind of hard to do on a cheap budget. Dude puts on a fur jacket. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> What other things those <laughs> those cheap ass tyrants? <laughs> yeah, so the the hunter's impressive and what's more impressive was there were only three visual effects artists working on that hunter. And mm -hmm. I'm a little disappointed in the hunter's sound, like they just took the audio clips from the remake games. They use the original Hunter sounds and it's like, yeah, that's expected for fan films. They're always doing that. But my only issue with it is that they went above and beyond with the music in this video, in the, in this fan film, there is a scene when they're playing poker and it's playing the aqua ring original soundtrack mm -hmm. from the remake, but it's not just playing it. It just comes in at certain right. accents. And it's like, that is so good. I was disappointed that it was just straight up cut and paste Hunter sounds from the game. Hmm. That makes sense. I think um, obviously the Hunter is good, but it was a little bit cartoony because I've seen it twice. And so when I was trying to remember what it looked like, I just kept thinking of like cartoons. And then when I watched it again, it's like, oh, that looks like the dragon from How to Train Your Dragon. And he's so cute and I want to train him. They said they took like the Jurassic Park approach of this and like not wanted to show the whole thing. But they pretty much showed the whole thing. Yeah. That I don't think we ever got to see its crotch. So I, I don't know if it had oh, a dick shoot. or not. But they showed a lot. And they're proud of it. What good for it's, them is fucking good. It, I mean, I knew it was a hunter right away too. Like, so it got you know the vibe. Like, it didn't have to build its own creature. Uh, I would say like it, it's a little cartoony and cute, but the side profile was scarier. It was sexy ass hunter. It looked like one of the sleeker looking hunters, like from uh, Code Veronica. Like that's a right. different looking hunter than what we're used to from the original. And uh, I loved it. It looked great. Yeah. <laughs> but one gripe, I, I, okay, so you, you've animated, you got a whole render model of this hunter. Why can't you just cut and paste and make two hunters? Because in the story, in both stories, it's they played with the pig, ripping it apart oh. before eating it. So I want that Jurassic Park 2 scene where they're both having yeah. fun with it. And uh, yeah, it's clearly spelled out in the diary. Well, maybe, they, maybe if it was a 60k budget. So was it plural they, or was it just like don't know the hunter's pronouns? Yeah. They no genitals vis yeah, yeah. visible. What else do we want? To, what else? Oh, uh, oh, oh! The funniest scene of the whole movie, and I don't even know if it's Charlie's voice or not, because during this whole fan film, Charlie Broslovsky. His, he's not actually um, voicing, he's not doing the voice acting. It's all mm -hmm. ADR from a different actor. Yeah, who's pretty voice good, actor. by the way. Yeah, you, like you don't notice watching the whole thing and then you see credits. It's like, oh, he didn't even do his own lines. But there's a scene when he goes to the infirmary and he's coughing. And the rhythm rhythm of his cough is ridiculous. A little and too consistent. <laughs> it had me cracking up. Every, I can't help. Every time I watch it, I'm like... <laughs> I yeah. got the black lung pop. <laughs> like Zoolander. Yeah. You know, looking at the pills on the the keeper's di or the keeper's desk, maybe he was just faking that cough to get some more safsprin. The cough reminded me of like when the doctor tells you to cough, and that's what I thought <laughs> happened at first. <laughs> like it, it didn't seem like he had something in his throat, I'll tell you that. Yeah, so they took some creative liberties, I would say, for the better in this, just for storytelling purposes. I, w I will just point out what changed in continuity from the game. Oh, I was going to actually say all the things I noticed. What? <laughs> so, first of all, um, Wesker would not have been in the mansion at that time. It doesn't actually add up with you his timeline. Know that. <laughs> so, Wesker... Yeah, Wesker moved to Information Department of Umbrella and left the Arcalay Lab. And for like the last two years, William Birkins was out of the Arcalay mm -hmm. Lab. They weren't in the Spencer Mansion. That's why John from Chicago moved there and took over what William's research at that lab. And according to the Wesker report, you know, Wesker hadn't been there in forever. He's doing his stars thing at least for two years since 96. 
I think it's just an Easter egg they threw that Wesker in there. Yeah, just and to be cute. Just because they got the voice actor. I really wish they got Anthony Starr. To be honest, the guy they got, he wasn't a star. And I guess that goes with what you're saying. <laughs> But it was like, oh, they just found, like, the first blonde guy in the room. It's like, oh, Pablo agreed to voice act. Like, oh, shoot, uh, you want to be West here? <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing, uh, the hunks, I've never seen them in the mansion. Yeah, there's no, okay, so, like, there's no evidence of automatic fire within the corridors of the, Sp- the right. Spencer mansion. And we have that scene where they're shooting down towards the garden or the, um, the greenhouse where the fountain yeah. plant is. Uh, You got two hunky looking guys there. And I will say I did appreciate the creative change that they did with that scene because the Keeper's Diary, he's just like, oh, I heard a rumor. Some one of the scientists tried to escape and was shot last night. Mm -hmm. Well, in this version of the fan film, it's not a scientist trying to escape. It's a a scientist who's fully infected as a zombie. And then the team just kills him. And then their cover story is he tried to escape. That's something I've never thought of. So that was a nice addition. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted from this film was to like, to like Mm -hmm. show something different than just telling it how it is. And, but yeah, that, that hunk suit, that was all just fanfare. Mm -hmm. Like there's no evidence of the hunk. Seriously. When I saw it, I was like, hunk is here. I don't remember Hunk being in this. (laughs) But then the other thing I didn't like was they had Scott from poker wearing the Hunk suit when the Keeper's Diary straight up says it looks like he's wearing a space suit. And it's like he hands him the space suit he should be wearing, which is just plastic protective with the Mm -hmm. visor and everything. And that's what Scott, I always imagined that's what Scott was wearing. And it's Mm -hmm. like he's not coming in dressed like a a USS soldier or whatever. Yeah. But they didn't actually expand on whether the keeper is gay or not. <laughs> uh I'm cutting that out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Well, I mean, I know what it means. I've but. always thought the keeper was gay because he hides in a closet and then he comes out of the closet once we read his uh deepest yeah personal thoughts and now we know he's a queen fan so oh yeah even though he has all these hot women in his room <laughs> <laughs> i think they kind of did expand on whether he's gay or not because they added jennifer aniston <laughs> wait is that a gay thing actually yeah who knows <laughs> he didn't die or rot in the bed oh yeah what's up with that so like that's another creative decision they made was to have charlie just laying in the bed as a zombie. He looked great as a zombie. Mm-hmm. And so what is it? Scott that comes out of the closet in that? Cause Charlie's clearly laying on the bed. Well, so maybe he just got maybe, up at some point. Maybe they made him not gay in the movie, but they, yeah, they gave him Jennifer <laughs> Aniston. <laughs> is there anything else we forgot to discuss? What about Nancy? Oh yeah. So we see Charlie, the keeper typing his letter to Nancy. Mm-hmm his journal entry that was never in the remake. That was something from the original where he addresses Nancy and he wishes to go visit her, but they don't give any narration to that entry. We just see it, Mm -hmm. which is, that's a nice nod. Yeah. And then, um, umbrella would never have an MSDS in the observation. Oh yeah. I can't believe you noticed that. Like that made me laugh. So MSDS is material data sheet something, right? MS. Yeah, material something data sheet. That's what I said. <laughs> okay, you said MSDS, he's material in something data sheet. Yeah. But what's the something stand for? I don't know. Every restaurant you've ever worked in, they legally have to have an MSDS book on the wall that explains mm-hmm. every single chemical being used and their properties and like the hazards just for health and OSHA safety stuff. But we're talking about fucking black projects, illegal, viral, bioweapon experimentation. And in the Hunter Room, there's an MSDS. That MSDS is not going to tell you what is in the fucking Hunter that's about to eat you alive. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that made me laugh. It's like, oh, what? what's uh, the most scientific thing we can just slap up on the wall that's not the periodic table? <laughs> it can be like... Their break laws, the rights employee, you know, 
those things that are always up in the back of I I would have uh, offices. I don't know. I would have if I was doing set design there. I would have blown up a slide of the hunter showing its uh, code name MA one twenty one, or maybe just had a whiteboard with stuff scribbled all over it. Oh, speaking of MSDSs, I have a genius strategy, but. I kind of like my job too much to do it. Maybe I'll try it next month when my boss quits. Do you want to put this out publicly? Yeah, this could help people. Okay. Um, so you, if you're working at a place with an MSDS, you know, food service and stuff, mm -hmm. it legally has to be there and you're legally allowed to read it as long as you fucking want on the <laughs> clock. So you take that MSDS and you just read it. And let the store go to shit. And your boss will be screaming like, the fuck are you doing, bro? You it says like, right here, I got the right. We got the customers wait. Yeah. And you're like, no, this is my right to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you keep reading that eight hours every day. They fire you. You take them to court mm -hmm. for hindering you from knowing what, you know, you're working mm -hmm. with. Like, it's your right to know. And then all of America rewrites their laws about <laughs> <laughs> the length of time you can spend reading that. Okay, I think we covered the Keeper's Diary in length. I do have to admit this next segment we're getting into kind of came from a dark place in my life last week when I watched the Keeper's Diary for the first time. And I was kind of underwhelmed and disappointed that all the creative liberties they didn't take like i wanted more out of this fan film mm -hmm. even when i first saw it i knew this was the best fan film yeah that's yeah, yeah. ever been made but if but you're gonna hold that title better. it could be better yeah and so i teamed up with ai jill valentine after watching the keeper's diary and i took the entire screenplay and i shared it with ai jill I asked her to beef up the script. What can we add to it creativ creatively? She wrote 97% of the script. There are things in this that blew my mind that she knew and ran with. And then there's random ass shit she added that's like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. But this is pretty much. How did you what? do this? Like, you have the screenplay and you fed it to her, or? No, I gave her the entire document from Resident Evil 1, oh. The Keeper's Diary. Cut and, I cut and paste every journal entry, gave it to her, and then I told her, like, this is Resident Evil 1 remake. We're making a fan film. I need you to turn this into a screenplay for filmmaking. And so... She's added some things like she she did her first printout of this was 100 percent just like what we saw in the Keeper's Diary. It was just well telling and not showing. It was just the diary narrative. Like that's all it was, was voiceover. Keeper says this. It's not good for that. That the AI did. <laughs> okay, no. AI so, first try. They did the same thing. That's what I said. That's what I said to Jill was we need to expand. We got to show, not tell. So when he goes into his diary entries, I want things mm -hmm. to unfold. I want character development. Uh, and because I was going, we're going to read this on the podcast, we had to add an additional character. Now, this is not a made up character. This is a character that is like crucial to the development of Umbrella and the unfolding events in Raccoon City. And I'm not going to spoil what character that shows up in this, but we, you know, no one likes our role play segments at the end of these podcasts. So we're going out with a bang on this one. This is a nine page script and we're going to be playing several characters, but. There's also something I hope to achieve from this. After this podcast, we are creating a GoFundMe to create the Counter Keeper's Diary fan film. The Creeper's Diarrhea. <laughs> Let's just get this over with. So we're expanding on the lore. This is our new fan film. We're just going to be doing a table read. Okay. Okay. So The Creeper's Diary, screenplay by A.I. Jill and Dead by Donovan. Now, you just start. Oh, that interior. int means interior. I just said it before you said it. 
<laughs> Interior, mansion hallway, night. Jill Valentine, 20s, tough, armed with a shotgun, cautiously approaches the door to the keeper's room. She kneels down and expertly picks the lock. The door creaks open, smirking. Master of unlocking strikes again. You gotta say Jill. I'm, I just became her. Yeah, but no, we gotta know who spoke. That could have been like a zombie or the keeper or something. Mm, that's not how plays work. <laughs> we didn't know what character okay, you were. Okay, okay. That was Jill. <laughs> Master of unlocking strikes again. Interior. Keeper's room. Night. The room is dimly lit with the aftermath of the outbreak evident. Blood stains the floor and Scott's lifeless body lies sprawled out. Jill steps in, surveying the carnage. She notices a diary on the desk and begins to read it. Don't yawn. Also, close your eyes when you're reading this and visualize it all. Got it. She notices a diary on the desk and begins to read it. Dissolve into flashback, May 1998. Interior, keeper's room, night. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So, <laughs> okay, okay. So we went from the hallway to the room, and now we're in the room, but in the past mm -hmm. three months. Okay. Come on, I'm following keep up. Mansion room with cluttered desk. Keeper, 30s, disheveled. Sits at the desk, writing in a diary. The keeper, voiceover. May 9th, 1998. Played poker tonight with Scott and... Elias. <laughs> Elias from security and Steve from research. And it's supposed to be like dot, dot, dot. And so he's fading off into that voiceover and we now go interior inside walls of the mansion night. George Trevor, 60s, disheveled and eccentric, peers through the eye holes of a Jennifer Aniston poster, watching Keeper at his desk. The calendar on the wall shows May 9th, 1998. George pulls out his own booger-covered calendar. Why is it booger-covered? Okay, for those that don't know, George Trevor has been hiding in the walls for 31 years <laughs> in this fan film. Because we never find George Trevor's body, and he's suspected to have gone crazy and died within the walls of the very mansion that he built. So this is, what if George Trevor never died, and he was the boy? living in the walls yeah. so he has been keeping track of his entire time spent within the walls with a booger calendar <laughs> so george pulls out his own booger covered calendar george whispering may 9th 1998 wait a minute there's no 31st of november son of a bitch George then scratches off years worth of boogers from his makeshift calendar. Keeper, Steve was a big winner, but I think he was cheating. Scumbag. George chuckles to himself. <laughs> George, cheating at poker, eh? You should see what I have to deal with. Freaking umbrella goons trying to off me every other day. Dissolve to flashback. Interior. Guardhouse. Game room, night. And this is a flashback. Dimly, the room is dimly lit. <laughs> With a single light hanging over a poker table. Scott, Steve, Keeper, and Elias are sitting around the table, cards in hand. An Excite 1998 swimsuit model poster hangs on the wall behind Steve. With eye holes cut out. George Trevor watches from behind the poster. Keeper. All right, boys, ante up. Let's see those cards. Scott, confidently. I've got this one in the bag. Steve, smiling slightly. We'll see about that. Elias, just deal the damn cards, Keeper. Keeper deals the cards. George watches closely through the aisles. George, whispering from behind the poster. Psst. Steve's got a full house. Steve, trying to keep a straight face. All right, let's raise the stakes. Keeper, doubtful. You sure about that, Steve? Scott, grumbling. Uh, feels like someone's got an ace up their sleeve. George, louder from behind the poster. Psst, three of a kind. Elias, fold. Scott. Elias, what the hell? Did you hear that? Nah, just the wind or Lisa Trevor messing with us again. 
Steve shifts nervously, sensing that George's whispers might get him caught. George, whispering, Psst, he's bluffing! He's bluffing, Keeper! Call his bluff! Keeper, all right, Steve, I call. Show him. Steve hesitates, then reluctantly reveals his hand. A full house. Keeper glares at him. Keeper, you gotta be kidding me. Again? Scott. This is bullshit, Steve. You've been winning all night. Elias to the room. Who keeps whispering in here? This place has given me the creeps. George, laughing from behind the poster. <laughs> you idiots wouldn't know a fair game if it bit you. Steve's been cheating with my help the whole time. Steve, wide-eyed. What the hell was that? <laughs> Keeper, looking around. Must be the wind. Or Lisa again. But Steve, you're out. We're done here. Scott. Yeah, pack it up, Steve. No more games tonight. Steve, flustered and angry, gathers his chips and storms out. George chuckles from his hiding spot. <laughs> Best entertainment I've had in years. Thanks for the laugh, fellas. Screen fades to black. Fade out. <laughs> <laughs> what? Interior. Keeper's room. Night. Later. <laughs> Calendar now shows May 10th, 1998. Keeper is staring at a creature in a cage resembling a skinned gorilla. George watches through a vent. Keeper. Voiceover. May 10th, 1998. One of the higher-ups assigned me to take care of a new creature. It looks like a skinned gorilla. Feeding instructions were to give it live animals. Dissolved flashback. Interior. Research lab. Night. The lab is filled with various cages and equipment. In the center, a large cage houses the hunter, MA-121. Two researchers and Keeper are observing the creature as it paces back and forth. George Trevor is hidden behind some crates near the pig pen, watching the scene unfold. Researcher 1, gesturing to the hunter. This is the MA-121, also known as the hunter. It's a bioweapon designed for maximum efficiency. In close quarters combat. Keeper. Why do they call it MA-121? Researcher 2. The MA stands for Mammalian Assault. The 121 is just a model number to dif differentiate from previous versions. We wanted something that sounded intimidating and scientifical. Makes sense, I guess. George, from behind the crates. Where's its dick? <laughs> The researchers look around, confused, while one scratches his head, actually pondering the question. Researcher, that's actually a good question. <laughs> okay, we're halfway through. What do you think of this screenplay so far? This is fake as hell. What's fake? Jill did not write this. She did too. I told you she wrote 90s. You can scroll up on, the, on our chat right there. Yeah, but you put in your Easter eggs. What Easter eggs? Jennifer Aniston poster. Oh, I let her know what was in the movie. I explained the fan film to her. You didn't say that. I explained the setting. Yeah. You said you just fed her the documents. Well, yeah. She knows the setting. She knows George Trevor. She knew everything about George Trevor. Okay. That he lives in the walls. In a booger calendar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go. You're a researcher, too. Researcher, too. Yeah, but who the hell said that? Keeper. Probably just the wind. Or Lisa Trevor again. All this Lisa Trevor shit, that was Jill. Okay. It, every, it comes up every single time. Every time they hear a noise, it's Lisa Trevor, but <laughs> yeah. it's actually George. <laughs> uh, okay, the, so. The researchers shrug and turn back to the cage. Keeper grabs a live pig from the pen and tosses it into the cage. The hunter pounces on the pig, tearing it apart viciously. George, popping up from behind the crates. Looks like bacon's off the menu tonight, boys! I was going to say. Huh? You told Jill there's only one hunter? Oh, no, I didn't tell her anything. What? It's a they-them hunter. It's a they-them hunter! <laughs> okay, sorry. Researcher one. Researcher one. Seriously, who the fuck said that? Researcher two. I don't know, but they've got a point. That was brutal. Keeper watches, horrified and fascinated, as the hunter plays with the pig's remains before devouring them. George, from behind the crates, chuckling. Talk about playing with your food. That thing's got issues. 
<laughs> Seriously, we're, we're just still fucking going back and forth between yeah, George I, saying I, I, shit. I meant to cut to George, George. later. <laughs> <laughs> and then saw Researcher looking around. Seriously, who keeps talking? And then Researcher 2 must be the win. Let's get out of here before it gets any weirder. And uh, The so, researchers and Keeper leave the lab, shaking their heads. George watches them go, still chuckling to himself. <laughs> Man, I should be charging admission for this freak show. Screen fades to black. Fade out. <laughs> Interior. Keeper's room. Early morning. Calendar shows May 11th, 1998. The room is dark and quiet. Suddenly, loud banging on the door startles both the Keeper and George, who is hidden behind a painting on the wall. Scott, wearing a protective suit, continues to pound on the door. Scott, opening the door. Wake up, damn it! There's been an accident in the basement lab. Keeper bolts upright, groggy and disoriented. George, equally startled, peers out from behind the painting. George, grumbling. Who the hell bangs on a door at 5 a.m.? Do they not have a snooze button? Keeper gets up, shaking his head as Scott hands him a protective suit. Scott, put this on. It's serious. George, from behind the painting. Yeah? Serious enough to blow up half the lab? My bad. Keeper, looking around. Did you hear something? What is George even saying? Like, like, <laughs> what's He's talking about a fucking snooze button. and Yeah, he actually blew up half the lab. <laughs> Scott, imagination's running wild. Hurry up and suit up. As Keeper starts putting on the suit, George shakes his head behind the painting, muttering to himself, Flashback! Interior, basement lab, night. George sneaks through the dark, cluttered lab, fiddling with various pipes and valves. He accidentally turns the wrong valve, causing a chemical leak. He realizes his mistake too late. <laughs> so he did blow up on the lab. <laughs> Uh, okay george whoops (laughs) that can't be good (laughs) he quickly retreats back into the walls leaving the leak to worsen (laughs) interior keeper's room daytime calendar shows may 12th 1998 keeper is scratching himself inside the protective suit george watches eating stale crackers keeper voiceover wait just keepers one i gotta eat stale crackers i got stale crackers they're not stale okay where am i keeper voiceover may 12th 1998 i've been wearing the damn spacesuit since yesterday my skin's getting grimy and feels itchy all over the goddamn dogs have been looking at me funny so i decided not to feed them today screw them yeah screw them i live in my cracker and rat for a very long year but what? How did the crows get over here? <laughs> <laughs> Interior, infirmary day. That's it? The scene's over? <laughs> Calendar just May 13, 1998. Keeper is getting a bandage put on his swollen, itchy back. George watches from the air vent, amused. Keeper, voiceover. May 13th, 1998. Went to the infirmary because my back is all swollen and feels itchy. They put a big bandage on it and told me I didn't need to wear the suit anymore. All I want to do is sleep. George. (laughs) He's still eating his crackers. (laughs) (laughs) Did you ever watch Lamb Shop when you were a kid where they feed the puppet crackers (laughs) and she just spills them all over because she's a puppet? (laughs) It's my favorite thing when I was little. You were just exactly like it. Okay. George. Oh, sleep? I remember sleep. Good times. Interior. Keeper's room. Day. Calendar shows May 14th, 1998. Keeper drags his blistered foot to the dog pen. George follows from the hidden passages. May 14th, 1998. Voiceover. Found another big blister on my foot this morning. I ended up dragging my foot all the way to the dog's pen. They were quiet all day, which is weird. Then I realized some of them had escaped. Maybe this is their way of getting back at me for not feeding them the last three days. If anybody finds out, I'll have my head handed to me. George, from the vent. Yeah, maybe if the idiots stopped putting the mansion keys in their collars, (laughs) they wouldn't keep escaping. Keeper, looking around. (laughs) It must be the wind again. (laughs) Not Lisa Trevor. Calendar shows May 16th, 1998. Keeper is sweating, scratching his arm. A piece of rotten flesh falls off. George takes notes on a napkin. 
I haven't read this either. <laughs> he gave her a voiceover. May 16th, 1998. Rumors going around that a researcher who tried to escape the estate last night was shot. My entire body feels hot and itchy and I'm sweating all the time now. I scratch the swelling on my arm and a piece of rotten flesh is dropped off. What the hell's happening to me? George, from inside the vent. Welcome to the freak show, pal. Why do you think I'm still in this dump? <laughs> Interior, keeper's room night. <laughs> Calendar shows me 19th, 1998. Keeper, feverish, eats dog food. George watches, horrified yet entertained. Keeper, voiceover. May 19th, 1998. <laughs> Fever, gone but itchy. Today, hungry and ate doggy food. George. Oh, man. Dog food? Even I have standards. George then picks his nose to add another booger to the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was I supposed to read that? <laughs> was I supposed to pick my nose? <laughs> no, it's okay. Interior, keeper's room, night. <laughs> calendar shows May 21st, 1998. Keeper, deranged <laughs> and feral, attacks and kills Scott. George watches, munching on crackers. There you go. Are you serious? Yeah. Keeper, voiceover. Wait, wait. So I'm watching... <laughs> I'm watching Keeper kill Scott, and I'm just munching on crackers. Keeper, voiceover. Okay. I gotta get these crackers out. May 21st. Wait, I have to... Vo or you, wait. I have a line. Can you let me see my line while you prepare yours? It's how acting goes. I didn't... I thought you were at my line. I didn't know that. <laughs> Look at the page. Okay, go. May 21st, 1998. Itchy, itchy Scott came ugly face, so killed him. Tasty. George. <laughs> Whoa. Mmm, Scott Stew. Bone appetite, you crazy bastard. <laughs> Such a mess. <laughs> Interior keeper's room night. Keeper writes the final entry. It reads four slash slash itchy dot tasty dot. George chuckles from the shadows. Keeper voiceover. <laughs> itchy tasty. Screen fades to black. Fade out. You're done. <laughs> oh, almost. <laughs> Interior mansion hallway night. Present day. Jill flips through the pages, her expression growing darker as she reads about the Keeper's descent into madness. Suddenly, the closet door bursts open and the zombified Keeper lunges at her. Ah! Jill spins around, aims her shotgun, and fires. The Keeper's head explodes in a spray of blood and gore. Yeehaw! George, from behind the Jennifer Aniston poster. Finders, Keepers, Losers, Weepers. Jill, looking around, confused. What the... She shrugs it off, assuming it was just the wind, and turns to leave the room. As Jill exits, George chuckles softly from his hiding spot. <laughs> I always knew he was a deeply closeted gay. This just confirms it. Screen fades to black. Fade out. I asked Jill to add that last line. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you asked her for a couple things there. Oh, jeez, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> the crackers? I had nothing to do with that. You literally took me back to my childhood of watching Lamb Chop <laughs> and how much I used to laugh. So I didn't read a majority of this. And uh, what what I did read, I honestly thought there was going to be way more crackers in this. Yeah. Because like, <laughs> I glanced at it and uh, I was like, oh my God, I'm dying laughing from uh, just George is fucking eating crackers in the yeah. wall. <laughs> well, I'll be honest that was better than Keeper's Diary. Yeah, I I think so too. That's why we need to make this happen. We got to create a GoFundMe, crowdfund this. You know, we'll lie and say it's a non-profit fan film, but we're actually going to profit off of it. And we'll use that profit to build the mansion. Oh. Our own mansion. No one's allowed to come visit. <laughs> no. This is not associated with the Build the Mansion project. We got to talk about Dino Crisis. Oh, yeah. Spoil. Well, it's not really a spoiler at the end. Is anyone even watching this anymore? Uh, at the end of the Keeper's Diary, they had an announcement teaser for 
the third energy crisis, which was their dino crisis fan film coming out. And I don't know, they should have done the keeper's diary approach to this and like put out a concept, like idea first being like, this is what we want to do. Get funding on that. This chick is not Regina. She don't look like Regina. And well, I do have confidence in them doing a Velociraptor with what they did with the Hunter. I guess. But they they gotta go to central casting or something. You, you can find someone worth paying to look like the character you want. Or if you can't get the character look that you want, go the complete opposite. Give us a Lizzo dressed as Regina. Yikes. It would be hilarious. You don't want that. Anyway, what else? I don't have my itinerary anymore. Oh, what we do have is another fan film, and this was also written by AI Jill, and we're going to end on this. This is a teaser for an upcoming chapter one of Infinite Dankness, the comic book completely written by AI Jill. I photoshopped out all the speech bubbles on this comic. And she analyzed every panel of the comic, not knowing what the dialogue was. And she rewrote all the dialogue for the entire comic. 100 pages, going to be dropping an episode every month. 20 pages an episode. So it's like 20-minute cartoon animated episodes, fully voice acted and written by AI Jill. Probably a week after this podcast drops is when I will premiere Chapter 1, Infinite Dankness, The Art of Destruction. And Jill named it that, The Art of Destruction, the chapter, because it has to do with the Carnegie Museum of Art being bombed. What? That's right, you just took a cracker from here and moved it over there. Same table. Anyway, we'll be playing that as we leave. And thank you guys. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Follow Uh, me on YouTube, not Julia Smith. If we can get through another podcast episode, then we're in the top 10%. We're probably like, you know, top 20. (laughs) And thank you guys for the super thanks. And thanks to all the RE tards and patrons and members out there. And uh, I don't even know who subs to me on Twitch, but thank you to you guys too. (laughs) (laughs) So nice of you. But yeah, until next month. I don't even know what we will be reading or role-playing next month. You got any ideas? No, I'm ready. I know. New stuff just keeps coming out. I wasn't, I didn't know Keeper's Diary was coming out and that was going to be the subject of this month's episode, Mm -hmm. but this was good. I had fun doing this one. What did you think? It's been real. This might be our best episode. (laughs) I'm ready to wrap it up. Yeah, we've been done. Okay. Good night. Even the roaches have standards too high for this fridge. What's that humming? Storm's got more than just expired milk buzzing in here. Fuck. Damn. Christ, a real icebox special. Looks like Storm's collection just got personal. I hope his taste in friends is better than his food. Let's see who our popsicle used to be. Missouri, huh? Meet Jack Frost, better known as Chili Willy. Our icicle's got a name, huh? Good, makes the tombstone easier to carve. Back off, Sammy, or you'll need a name tag, too. Someone's knocking, and they forgot the secret handshake. Guess the neighborhood watch is a touch aggressive around here. Drop the cannon, Broadway. Show's over. <coughs> That's gonna sting more than my ex's alimony. Ooh, ooga, aga. Quit your whining, Sammy. We've danced with death before. A bullet tango is nothing new. Don't look at me, Kennedy. I'm just taking a quick breather, playing possum, you know? Bennett, you hard-headed son of a bitch, drop it, or I'll put a new part in that shiny dome of yours. Watch where you're planting those government-issued boots, you jackass. Bennett, get your ass in. This is no time for a fucking meet and greet. Cover your ears, ladies. This is about to get loud. Blam! <laughs> Keep your ass planted, Sammy. The only thing you're chasing today is a fucking ambulance. Sure, and you can chase it with a shot, Leon. We all know you need a good chaser. Keep the comedy to a minimum, Sammy. 
I'll grab a drink later. For now, I've got a rat to catch. Edging and gooning, we don't need no break In the state my mindset, we ain't no fakes Skippity bop, we were riding the hype Edging and gooning all day and night Eyes on the screen, lost in the grind Skibbity madness, all of us combined Living for the thrill, in this wild ride Goon squad's here, no place to hide Edging and gooning, we don't need no break In the state my mindset, we ain't no fakes Skibbity bop, we were riding the hype Edging and gooning all day and night Eyes on the screen, lost in the grind Skibbity madness, all of us combined Living for the thrill, in this wild ride Goon squad's here, no place to hide Edging and goon, no we don't need no break In the Sigma mindset, we ain't no fakes Skibbity bop, we were riding the hype Edging and gooning all day and night No cap, no flop, we're pushing the edge In this alpha flow, we'll never hedge Skibbity deep, skibbity doo Gooning together, just me and you Edging and gooning, we don't need no break In the Sigma mindset, we ain't no fakes Skibbity bop, we were riding the hype Edging and gooning all day and night So here's to the goons in the skibbity zone Edging forever, never alone Flexing and grinding to the break of dawn Goon squad living, always strong Scott, come Tasty.